Hi, everyone, and welcome. I see our numbers are still ticking upwards, so we will give this a slow start, but welcome everyone to the art lecture series. This is the third installment of the winter art lecture series, and I'm Kathleen Amen. I teach social and political philosophy and aesthetics here at Evergreen. Uh, I'm currently teaching in the Marxist Capital, Capital Crypto and the Mystery of Money program, also here in attendance. So hi to all of you who are here with the program um, and welcome everyone else. Uh, I'm going to take the chance again here at the opening to thank our colleague and friend, faculty and artist member Shah Osha for her hard work building up the culture around this series over many years and curating it, I was going to say, uh, always curating it energetically and uh, with great finesse. We It brings so much to our community. Um, so thanks also to Evergreen for supporting the series and as always to our uh, colleagues and friends providing the media support for us from setting up and running our tech uh, dur during these talks and um, preparing the recordings that get shared on our Evergreen YouTube channel. Raul gets a special thanks today and all of the days and Rose, Vivian, and Yana are with us today as well, so thank all of you. Um, as a reminder of the format, our honored guest will speak for about an hour, and then we will ask all of you to engage in the follow-up conversation for the last half an hour. Please use the raise hand button and we can call on you. We'd love to hear your live voices. Uh, we really do appreciate any live voices in this setting, right? We're a little alienated and uh, whatever we can do to welcome each other and be in contact, we really appreciate. Um, so if you're able and you're willing to join us live, that's great. But we also would love to get your questions, of course, using the Q&A function in the chat. And um, normally I would moderate that conversation or Shaw would. And today uh, Miranda is going to do that as well. So I am going to hand things over now to another beloved colleague and friend, our very own Miranda Mellis, who teaches fiction, nonfiction, Contemporary Literature and Ecological Humanities here at the college. And she is gonna give Sean the formal introduction uh, that Sean deserves and facilitate the conversation to follow. So Miranda, it's to you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, welcome everyone. I am just so very excited um, for today's, today's art lecture. Um, I'm Miranda Mellis. I am teaching writing as experimental and ecological practice this quarter and uh, welcome to, to our program and to everyone else and to the members of the public who might have joined us today. Um, Sean Negus is a writer and artist who works in the expanded field of poetics. Uh, in addition to Hurricane Music, a brilliant and highly recommended book of poetry published by Sean bilingually in Portuguese and English, Sean has also published an artist book in limited edition Congres. Sean's transmedia projects have explored forms of visuality, performativity, and collaboration. As a translator and editor of contemporary Brazilian and Portuguese poetry, they have edited Saccades, as well as Ducey 21. Sean is a professor in writing and literature and critical studies at both California College of the Arts in San Francisco and Santa Clara University. Sean's current work, Inquiring into Archival Poetics, has been exhibited in publications by the Goethe Institute and Tassawarat Collective, an experimental publishing platform. Sean and I collaborated on a performance piece uh, in 2021 with filmmaker Lynn Marie Kirby um, called Oracular Chorus. And so Sean and I have developed a conversation around poetics of divination. So I thought I would pull a tarot card this morning for Sean's visit. Um, and I pulled the Ten of Cups. For those familiar with tarot, um, you'll know that a, a very salient reading of this card is that it has to do with happiness and with contentment, with feeling satiated. And that feels just right for the joy of welcoming Sean to Evergreen. There's another angle on the card from, from a book by Jessica Doré called Tarot for Change. And in this interpretation, um, it, it centers on a term that I just learned about after pulling this card this morning ca called um, emo diversity, emo diversity. This term as um, the author for Tarot for Change refers to it, uh, describes holding space for and including the whole range of emotions as a key to resilience and thriving. 
The interpretation uses the analogy of the rainbow to point out the importance of not disavowing any element of our emotional weather. Doing so, the author writes, would be akin to banishing the color green from the rainbow. That was the example. Um, I link this to Sean's conjoining of their practice as a diviner, as a contemplative, with their work as a writer, translator, and scholar, listening deeply and scrying in the archives in all their multiplicity, and to the skillfulness, intuition, rigor, discernment, aesthetic luminosity, and compassion that Sean brings to their craft, to their contemplative poiesis. About archival matter, Sean writes, Somehow in the 3D plane of existence, there is an imprint on things which carries a sort of stamp in being. Its resonance sings out through an opening in time-space opacity. In thanks and with great happiness and contentment, please extend a warm greener welcome to Sean Nagus. Thank you so much for being here with us, Sean. Thank you, Miranda. Um... Yeah, that was that was really beautiful and, and deeply appreciated. So thank you for that um, introduction. It's it's always so interesting to kind of see your work reflected through someone else, especially someone that I respect um, so much. So thank you, Brenda, and thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, Evergreen, and everyone who's here. Um, I'm really excited to be here, and I've. I've actually prepared new work um, to share. So um, some of this has not been test driven. Uh, it's kind of off the cuff in a way, although I will say that I invested a, a few consecutive days of just burrowing myself um, in and, and really focusing and diving deep. So I hope the conversation that follows this work and follows this presentation um, can enrich you, can enrich your practice and, and reflect back um, whatever it needs to. One, one brief thing maybe before I begin is this, uh, the Ten of Cups card that was, that was really fantastic. Um, and emo diversity um, is kind of spot on. I don't know if this falls into the category of, of divination or intuition, Miranda, but actually yesterday I, I got this flash and I was like, I need to put in a rainbow, right, into one of these images. And so I was searching for kind of like an archival rainbow and then I was trying to like squeeze it in, but it really didn't work at all. In fact, it kind of ruined it. So I left it out, but it's, it's very interesting that the rainbow came back. So, so thank you for that. Um, that's very cool. So um, I'm going to begin just kind of the, the first part of this and to give you a sense of how I'll organize it. Um, first, I'd like to just do the presentation of the work, almost like a reading and a media share. Um, then I'll talk a little bit on my process and kind of my decision making before I, I hear from you and we can have a conversation about anything that you'd like. Um, but I want to take a moment kind of in the spirit um, that Miranda brought to us and, and just kind of clear out some of the things that we might have brought with us um, and to make space for, for mystery, actually, and for the mystery, capital, capital T on that one. Um, so yeah, just maybe a, a brief moment here in silence, just a quick invitation to mystery. Okay, so let me share with you my PowerPoint. And if I could get, let's see, a thumbs up from anyone. Let me put this full screen. You can see this? Yep. Okay, awesome, thanks. What? The noir precognition is diffused by atmospheres and sublimated by beauty, arborescent 
silhouettes and hard incandescence. In the American ledger of dark expressions, the old world remains a fossilized charm. Sense of future foreboding, the house is abandoned and inside a playground of forgotten forms. One likes to say darkness, but means of binary inversion of inexact measures. Its origin concealed with apocrypha, apocrypha, familiar songs, and selective biographies. Black is intoxicant as opium, as ecstasy without penance, and dream vessels, ink rivers, vicious, viscous flows. There's a certain agnosticism when thinking about night. Despite our best efforts, the corporate simplex syntax propagates. The destination point misnamed for currency crips. In the Hollywood Regency regalia of solar inscriptions, a material heaven is made legible. Gore faced in indexing the mood makers and monoliths whose flattened magic is overcome and reduced to noise. The escape score remains unwritten. The future, the consolation of boundaries and concessions, the rows reduced to zero. The spectacle of history is analog fear, a mammalian theft. In second sight, the seduction of a dark ecology, erasure of the many for the recollection of the one. Topographies of the social subsumed in espionage by the clinical psyche in white, the dream utility multiplied. A lunar devouring of Earth-worn lovers, their bodies consumed, the craving contained its sacrifice unauthored. Two, if myth could be sepia, cinema delivered to mist, or the world ordered on milk-signaled mysteries, being elemental, watery, and undone with machines to read the relations, merging unmade by custom, just how it is. So drown under the real to find eclipse essence, that dark ecology again, scored with spirits, where we put plants to rest in the same shitty equation with death. Quantum colored rainbows etched in the medical device, news of the non human. A season's worth of cellular activity, skyward wintry clouds like California, the same as northern early spring. Subaltern histories of childhood and the wash of world in thin purples. The artifacts come swallowed with captions, not devoured by the vectors of history's phantom limb. Flatlined with analog rituals of yesteryear, all jangled by condition that molecular heaven hides, a century of regrets held in the center and resented like rain. A hagiographic score of divine movie moments pans into center. Then all of the constellations conjunct over the crevasse, where past bodies melt into the register. Tried for redemption in the afterworld fires, but found only apple tree starvation.
3. Red drift on the noir terrain. The hunger artist unearths the real, reworking the worn scripts. All lunar lore and iterations of science. Marbled heavens and night and indigo joust of the social contract in lives where each was killed or has killed, certainly both, in role rehearsals and costume jewelry, faking pride and the usual states. Searching shadows for a bank of superior copies, the running out of midnight. Bourgeois spider mother fantasies and their wrought iron descendants. String crimson for consecutive hearts speak in the heavenly house, born of full destroyers. So thank you for, for sitting through that. Um, I just wanna talk a little bit about um, what attracted me to, to the archive and how we've approached the archive as, as primarily and principally first a poet. Um, and I would say, that, you know, my attraction to the archive was kind of born out of a, a, a dissatisfaction or an angst and wishing to really have something like a, a material object or um, even a visual uh, to hold on to and, and to work with and to, to divine and, and scry and um, relate to. Just, just a reference point because um, poets draw from all kinds of you know, domains to do their work, um, but I found myself kind of wishing I had more um, materiality, material um, that I could really look at. And uh, maybe a little bit envious also of uh, visual artists with kind of robust um, practices and, and gear and um, all of that. Um, so I, I started working first with just a lot of materials that I would gather, um, usually when traveling, um, you know, it's not necessarily seeking novelty, but seeking a way to think about um, the relationships between places, between times, and what that can can reveal, what the contrast um, can can show. Uh, but I was also really influenced by um, artists like um, Batia Suter, whose book I have here, um, and she's kind of this wonderful artist who. Um, creates artist books, and they're really just a sequence of archival images. But it's almost like she constructs this fantastic sequence. It's like a poetic sequence. And so the images create their own poetics in a way, like juxtaposition and um, relationalities just within the book. Uh, but to flip through a hundred pages uh, becomes this really moving, interesting experience. Um, her work, uh, Bill Morrison, um, the Decasia project, uh, where he found all this old film footage that um, had survived kind of spontaneous combustion um, from, from the North. I wanna say it's either the Yukon or town in like, uh, Northern Alaska, but an Arctic um, kind of uh, colony. Um, and these films were made, you know, uh, to promote the colony and to draw people in, especially for like the pursuit of gold and, and other extractive, um, you know, um, purposes. But but the films that he found um, were partially destroyed, partially damaged. And he, he created this project, the Decasia project, um, that just really beautifully works with the way that time had eroded and imprinted itself 
on on the objects on the materiality of, of the film um, and his interventions with, with the original um, films are really moving and beautiful and um, haunting in a way um, and then of course Zena Parkins who is is a harpist but uh, she she made this album I think it's Mall Mouth Betrayer I always get the last part wrong but um, and she she was interested in making a kind of an experimental album working with uh, Jewish gangsters in you know like the 1930s prohibition era even um, New York and so she imports a lot of sound clips of um, these these notorious gangsters um, so people like that really shined a light on, on how archival materials could serve as windows and portals, not just to the past, but really um, mirrors on our present, on our present condition. And I'm going to get into a little bit of, of theory, hopefully nothing um, too heavy, but just to excavate some of the ground that, that I like to traverse and how I like to orient to the archive. Um, I should mention two other influences though, and I'll put this in the chat for people to see. One is Poe X, which is a really kind of expansive and experimental um, movement in Portugal. And since the 1970s, this, this group of primarily poets have been thinking about poetics in this expansive way, this inclusive way not just integrating like visual materials but even thinking kind of outside of um what we what we might call um conventional forms and so um somewhat controversially uh, one of the latest iterations of uh, this poetics was to genetically engineer like um a, a rabbit that glows in the dark um which is there are ethical, I think, questions about that for sure, but um, but their reach for poetry and poetics is really um, fascinating. And then the concretismo movement of Brazil, taking cues from Marshall McLuhan and kind of the, the verbal, visual, and vocal elements all, all working together. So um, all of that really served as, as inspiration and, and um, encouraged my, my pursuit of the archive. What Miranda says is true, though. I really do think of the archive as, um, in some ways, a divinatory practice, but also one that could be grounded in um, the social sciences and inquiries that attempt to excavate and access different social information through, through the materials. Um, and so it's a really rich repository of the past and almost like a tome of, of memories, right? The discarded ephemera um, that we constantly generate um, and consume. But, but where does it go, right? Where does this record of, of our living go? And I think the proliferation of media, especially in the 20th century, um, has provided a lot of opportunity to kind of reflect and look back and to see like, well, between then and now, um, what does this contrast like reveal for us? What can it show us about what it means to be human, what it means to be situated in a certain space or a culture, right? Um, and so the richness of that social information um, becomes kind of the site of working a poetic inquiry and um, allows me to contemplate other temporal realities, access old and then enter history's folds, you know, kind of some of these intentions. Um, some of you might be familiar with uh, Jacques Derrida's concept of hauntology and, and part of what I like to imagine that I'm doing, even if it's just play, is um, kind of entering into a seance with these archival materials to read their R's of the past. Um, is it telemetry? Is it telemetry that we psychometry, I think, yeah, where people hold an object and then try to try to read it. Um, 
all of this just to kind of access that ontological trace, um, what it pertains of its origin and also its um, movement through time. I like to imagine these as transhistorical transmissions and um, in a way it has the seed uh, of revealing the present for us through the past. A little bit about um, poetics though, like how is you know, our archival practice um, a form of poetics or how could it be thought of as a form of poetics? Um, the boundaries of that, of that domain of uh, poetics, I think has already really been uh, expanded. You know? And I think in some ways I'm, I'm the happy recipient and, and heir of other people's good works. You know, scholars um, using that term in different, different ways, different contexts, applications of poetics, but also poets who, who thought about the, um, using poetry as a kind of device or technology um, for including more and more uh, of the world. And so I like to imagine that poetry or poetics really is a, a technology. And one of the ways that I approach that when I work with archives is actually through the software applications or the technologies that, that I use to manipulate the originals. Um, typically I take photos of the original archival materials um, and have a digital copy. And so then I'm, I'm pushing pixels, right? And kind of manipulating uh, a copy of the original. And there's, there's implication there in the reproduction of an original, um, of, of having kind of a phantom copy that one can manipulate. Um, but even in, in the software applications, Photoshop, for instance, uh, the tools themselves kind of contain uh, poetics. And so we think about things like erasure, um, juxtaposition, superimposition, um, all the various tools in some ways, they inscribe um, a, a meaning onto the original, onto the image, onto the, onto the archive. You know, what, is it, what does it mean to erase or to remove um, context? What, what does it mean to um, bring together different images and have them talk to each other? Um, to show the hand of the technology itself, uh, kind of there coexisting with the original in, in a way that's kind of undifferentiated. Um, so all of these things I like to imagine also contain a kind of a trace of the poetic and um, yeah. And so it's that, and it's really kind of forming an alliance with verbal poetries. Um, it's having uh, verbal poetry talk to the visual poetry and see what comes through kind of what I like to imagine as a rhizomatic constellation, right? The kind of back and forth conversation between the image and the, the verbal um, and to see what comes through that that kind of dialectic or that exchange. I would definitely say that um, my practice is still expanding, um, but I'd like to share with you if I, if I can get this to work really quickly, a, just a brief look at some other projects and maybe to share with you the evolution of, of this inquiry. Um, so for a while I was living um, in a neighborhood in San Francisco, um, out by the ocean, kind of an unpopular part of the city because it's very foggy and there's not necessarily a lot to do. Um, but I was there for a good 10 years, you know, connected to the place. Um, and, and I got interested, you know, in the history of that place and kind of reached out to the California Historical Society um, where they had an archive and also a, a photo archive housing some of minor whites um, photos, which he took uh, of the neighborhood. And, and I basically found 
um, images of exactly the same place, like across the span of a century, and eventually put them in relationship to each other in kind of layers, um, just to see what would happen. And um, so it's one of my first attempts to really bring together these different materials and to think about um, formulating something like a visual poetic, um, remixing the originals, but also kind of letting them letting them be what they are or what they will be. I would say that I, I try really intentionally um, to manipulate the originals only when I'm guided to by the actual object. And so um, they might be called interventions, but I'm, I'm looking and I'm listening and I'm trying to feel for what the original wants to do. And I'm trying very carefully not to kind of assert my own will or my own vision um, onto the archival artifact, but really to kind of let it uh, unfold in, in an organic way where um, the trace of the original is always present and centered. Um, and any intervention that I might uh, kind of conduct is really there to augment whatever that, that trace or whatever even the potential of, of the poetic suggests. Um, so in this way, I really do think of it as kind of like a conversation um, or a listening or a looking with the ar archival artifact. Um, early on though, I think in 2018, I was um, traveling a lot to Brazil and just thinking about really the differences between material culture there and the, the things that one finds, kind of the rich ephemera of magazines, um, photographs that one kind of takes themselves, right? Moving throughout a space. And all of this became kind of the, the very first ground, I would say, for thinking, uh, extending the, the verbal poetic to both the digital and the visual. And something, something within this project, within this pursuit or experiment, started to suggest possibility um, of thinking about archives as the site for accessing more and more social information. And um, it, just a really delightful kind of experiment, working with all kinds of different iterations of form and thinking about how they can work together. Um, and exploring kind of the, the rich field of, of culture and, and poetics as a technology of inquiry. And I, and I guess maybe I'd kind of like to um, center that is, is for me ultimately poetics is, is a way of asking questions and it's a way of um, thinking about um, transforming things out there in the world into something that is at once uh, unrecognizable, but but also has the potential to reveal some other truth, right? Some other way of thinking or looking at the world, and and to in turn kind of transform our consciousness. Um, yeah. So a little bit about um, this project that I just shared with you before I. I'm really interested to hear from all of you and you know what you have to say. Um, but, but this project that I shared with you was, was really an extension of a couple of um, artist residencies that I've done in Portugal over the last couple of years. And it, being someone who studies the Portuguese language and who translates uh, both Brazilian and Portuguese poetries, um, I was I was interested in kind of the relationship between the old world and like the new world, you know, the Americas plural, and and what what the difference between like that old world and new world could reveal, and so gathering kind of materials, a lot of these uh, just come from magazines, um, 
and going to old bookstores or um, any place where I could kind of access um, a window onto the past and to try to understand what it what it can show us about ourselves. And what came up was a lot of interesting um, constellations of meaning, you know, thinking about how Europe at, reflects back onto America or the Americas. And, and from this vantage point, right, from being American, right, what is it like to look back onto um, Europe and, and uh, histories of colonization, histories of imperialism, right? Um, all of these worldviews kind of embedded within objects that we can, we can look at to try to divine our present and maybe even also the future, but um, also just honestly, just relishing in kind of the, um, the richness of all of the things history forgets, you know, um, and the diversity of, of the human experience and, and putting that in relationship um, to itself. And so for this project, um, choosing the images, whatever that really spoke to me, I, I started to realize that a lot of them were kind of dark. And, and then I realized, well, this is almost like a uh, film noir, yeah? And, and then I was just kind of playing with that idea of an archival noir and, you know, what does it mean for, um, for there to be a, a visual poetics that's um, dark and drawing from kind of aesthetic histories like um, German Expressionism, which I really do see a, a relationship between the American film noir and, and German expressionism and then how is that how is that kind of surfacing in a lot of this content or how could it be made to surface in in this content um one of the wonderful things about poetry is that you can forge new relationships between things where they might have been latent or where they might have not existed at all and kind of play around right in the field of of, of meaning and so in, in thinking about uh, writing for this project, um, first I was going to just pursue a kind of a caption, poetic caption for each image and um, read it out loud as, as a lyrical fragment or something to that effect, right? Um, but then I started to realize that it's more, it's more like a storyboard, right? And then giving each, each board its, its own micro narrative as a, as a progression, as a sequence, and as a way of um, getting further acquainted with what it might be called an archival noir. Um, and that's really, you know, it's, it's it, it, all, of, all of these images ended up reflecting back to something that uh, the noir has to show us about ourselves, you know, in our culture. Um, and I think we're in times right now where, um, we're certainly the darkness that we're confronted with as Americans, um, even as global citizens, it has to be productive. Like we have to find a way of, of reworking it, reimagining it, transforming it, um, so that it's less menacing. And one thing that I think film noir aspired to do was not just to kind of relish in, in the darkness, but to disempower it by making it into art and entertainment. And, and I think in a way I'm trying to um, also thread different lines of inquiry into a, a noir that surfaces things for us to think about, or at least myself to think about. Um, yeah, and then to, to to diffuse the darkness a bit and so that it doesn't have so much power. Um, the last thing I think that I, that I would just like to say is that um, one of the things that I was conscious of and trying to push back against, which I, is a perennial problem in, 
in our language systems, right? Uh, thinking of colonization and um, its legacies, but it's the binary um, problem of trying to point to things that, um, like when we say that something is dark, there's positive implication for that as well as like in everyday speech. Um, people typically kind of refer to that negatively, but uh, I wanted also to kind of reimagine and rework the noir as something that is, is full of mystery and full of um, kind of pregnant with potential and meaning um, and something that's positive. And so, so I, don't, I don't want to end by re reifying or re-emphasizing um, those binary relationships between, you know, good and lightness and, right, um, that's kind of, I think, uh, damaging. It's, it's, it's a damaging worldview. Um, that's really all I have to share with you, and, and I'm so delighted to be able to, to do this, and thank you for the opportunity, and, and I'd love to hear what any of you have to say, um, even if it's not just a question for me, even it's something that you're working through in your practice or your scholarship or just your, your thinking, um, I would be happy to invite any of that uh, conversation. Thank you so much, Sean. This was just absolutely exquisite. Um, I I put on my rainbow cravat. I had to change my cravat because of the bringing back of the rainbow. So um, <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, that's um, beautiful. <clears throat> so I know people will have questions, um, but I'm gonna you know take permission as um, as your interlocutor and facilitator of the discussion to, to start with the first kind of set of questions. Um, I, um, you uh, were speaking about the archival, archival poetics as a um, repository of past. Um, and this ephemera would constantly generate and consume. Um, and this work of, of reworking and metabolizing and transforming um, and of, of illuminating not just the past, but the present. You know, this came up a, a few times in the way that you're theorizing your exquisite practice of interanimating visual art and, and poetry, this interanimating relationship. You spoke of poetics as a way of asking questions um, and of entering through the archives into history's folds. Um, <clears throat> in these trans-historical transmissions, um, and I, the question that I wanna ask kind of with saying back some of the um, eloquent um, articulations that you offered, um, and this idea of using poetry as a as a device or a technology for including more and more of the world, um, and kind of the, the the dark ecology, the luminosity um, that you just spoke to at the end, you know, the luminosity pregnant with possibility of the dark. Um, I and then you mentioned maybe the illumination of. Um, these materials from the past, these archive, archives that, that can kind of um, show us something of the past and also you emphasize of the present. And then you mention maybe even of the future um, in, in, in all of the things that history forgets. And this sort of gets at this kind of um, the, the nexus of my nested um, question, which has to do with this space of past, present, future and the, the curious way that the oracular looks back and looks forward and how this work that you're doing, um, how you see it um, in relation to kind of futurity. So you brought up um, Derrida's ontology 
And I think one of the characteristics of our moment is this sense of being quite haunted by the future, the question of the future, right? Um, and the questions of the future. Um, and so I think I, I want to just invite you to reflect on the maybe perhaps the relationship of how the poetics participates in the labor of creating the present, creating history, participating in the labor of, of the history of the present as it unfolds, and what poetics kind of offers us in that space that you so beautifully described of kind of um, making things less menacing, the reworking and the necessity of transformation, you know, and, the, and, and this kind of social, political, ethical work um, that poetics does in that space. And um, does that, I hope that, I think that's, anyway, that's the sort of field that I'm, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, it's a really rich um, question. And if I, if I don't touch on a part, like, let me know and, and I'll try to uh, work it in. I think it's a big question, right? It's kind of a, it's a living question. You know, what work does poetry do in the world? Um, and I think it's easy to fall back sometimes and to say, from an American perspective, that we undervalue poetry and that, you know, um, poetry, poetry is kind of a marginalized form for us, where it's really not in so many other cultures, right? It's kind of at the center of, of their culture. Um, but for us, not, not really so. Um, so it's easy to be dismissive, I, I think, of poetry's power. Um, but I would answer that question differently, like not maybe thinking of the, the form of poetry and how it enters the stream of uh, discourse and talks to other discourses. Um, but I would actually think of it as um, reworking consciousness and center really the, the social praxis of making of all kinds, whether that's poetry or art, you know. Um, and I, and I would say that the makers, you know, whether they're poets or, or artists or anything, that's it's those people who are actively transforming their consciousness, their reality, and their reception of the world. That's kind of where the work is done, right? Um, without being too hippy dippy, right? There's a lot we don't know about consciousness. And I think there are interesting theories about consciousness being kind of a field, right? Um, kind of a panpsychist approach to thinking of, of consciousness. And maybe it's true that on one level or in one way, when whenever we sit down to kind of think of um, the present and to, to rework the present or to transform the present, almost alchemically, you know, through a creative practice, that that we're participating in, in rethreading or reworking or repairing parts of that whole field. Um, I, I don't know if that's necessarily true, but maybe it's one possibility, one way of, of looking at it. Um, and in doing that, maybe we're helping to kind of redirect the arc of the future um, and with a certain amount of like you know humility and and realness maybe we won't be able to completely mitigate the harms of the future or, or the difficulties of the future but certainly we can kind of invoke them and and prepare for them but also uh oriented to them in a way now, right, in the present, where I don't know, we have, we have, I don't know, a uh, greater ability to participate in those, in those futures and those things. Does that kind of answer your question? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm brought to mind um, as well of your 
your your practice and your studies and in 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 Buddhism and and of the sort of um, teaching around um, that we are that time is sort of um, just this one ever changing moment. Your remarks kind of brought me back to that um, as well, right? That future is is a concept in a sense. Um, yeah. Um, so I'll open it up now. I'll open up the floor to uh, other questions. And I see a note from Kathleen that um, uh, we we had the we had to conjure the mental image of clapping all around initially. Um, so there's that. We we see that image. <laughs> and I'll pause now just to make space. Please raise your hand if you have a question or remark or response. The floor is open. And Miranda, are you able to see that Zach has raised a hand and has joined the list of panelists up at the top? You know, I'm not seeing that. It's I. It's curious. I'm not seeing that. So maybe Kathleen, I wonder if you might. That's not coming up on my screen. So maybe you can. Well, why don't I just call on Zach? Yeah, great. Even though. <laughs> um, Hi. Yes. Um, first and foremost, uh, I want to appreciate you for your time. Um, it was super informative. Uh, I'm a musician, creative as well, and the visual aspects of kind of where you seek your influences and um, kind of using archival influence and matching that aesthetic. I really appreciate that. And just uh, kind of unlock another dimension and level of creation for my own personal endeavors. Um, so I just want to say thank you first and foremost. Um, I accidentally hit the raise hand button. Um, so I did not necessarily have a question prepared, but I did want to at some point at least thank you for your time and um, creating this space for um, really, really beautiful art and um, inspired by it. So that's that's what I'll share for now. But if I can think of the question, I will definitely raise my hand again. Thank you. No worries. Thank you. Kathleen, I might ask you to um, take up the questions because I'm not seeing them. Absolutely. So I can see that Astra has a hand raised. And we have after that a, one question in the queue. Go for it, Aster. Hi, Sean. Um, I also just really want to thank you for your time and in talking to us. Um, a lot of what we've been reading and talking about in Miranda's class um, just, I mean, yeah, really aligns with everything that you're doing and everything that you're exploring. Um, but really explores this, like, I guess the dark side of the moon of everything that we've been talking about. Um, so I know you mentioned dark ecology. Um, we also read Timothy Morton and like talked about this concept of the mesh and like also last quarter talked about this concept of fractals and like iterations of things. Um, so I just really love and admire that you're exploring all of these like forgotten things um, because yeah, it just seems rich. Like there's so much there um, and they too like um, affect our present and fractal out um, in ways that we're unaware of. Um, so I just, I just think that that's a brilliant concept. Um, and yeah, it definitely has a lot of relevance when it comes to um, colonialism and these structures of power and how they're invisible and they have these um, forgotten effects on our present as well. So don't really have a question. Um, I just really wanted to tell you that I think it's so illuminating keyword, um, but yeah, appreciate you and your time and what you're doing. I'm super intrigued. Thank you, Esther. Yeah, I really, I appreciate that so much. Um, and I'm so, I'm glad that you also mentioned the, the dark ecology thing, because yes, it's definitely kind of uh, Timothy Morton and his really incredible work, um, which, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm just astonished by uh, Timothy Morton's work and yeah, all of his capacity. So it's great that you're reading and thinking about those things. Yeah, it's fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, oh, 
Thanks. Okay. So much. Oh, Sean. Kathleen. Yeah, I was just going to say, I can see, uh, I have a little bit different view, I think, from Miranda. So I'm going to help navigate the questions and answers. And I'll start with a, a comment that was put in the Q&A uh, submit section from August. who says, thank you for the great talk. I hadn't heard of this art form before, and it's inspiring me to think about doing a project with archival images and text, maybe a collage. <laughs> so that's from August. I don't know if you want to say anything back. That's great. Yeah. Um, yeah, embrace the archive. And one thing I didn't talk about is, is the archive can be really anything. Like you can create your own archives. You know, there are people that do really radical things, like in kind of inventorying different different things and, and using that to kind of ground their thinking in things. Um, uh, but then there's also like really cool like personal archives. You can kind of go and create, you know, an archive of, of your past and, and all that. So there's so much, so much to work with um, of these materials. That's great. And we had a hand up. Oh, here we go. It's back. Uh, Rain, did you want to join the conversation? Yeah. Hi. Um, thank you so much, Sean. Um, this has been such a like inspiring talk just as like an artist who often struggles with um, like seeing the meaning behind the work um, just based on like, you know, there's like the sense of like spiritual depression where you're kind of doing the work and it feels inspiring and meaningful and beautiful yet you don't really feel like the ripples of it at all times um so I guess I'm just like I don't really necessarily have a question just more of like thoughts bouncing around but um I guess I'm just like curious how you continue on the course and if you have ever like struggled with um <laughs> the work um but I also feel like in that way, like this sense of like disempowerment is also an important step to experience um, because it's like coming back home to to art um, by like transforming that that kind of like darkness. So I just really, really appreciated that. And it was so well said. And I yeah, it, I felt it definitely transformed something within me, um, <laughs> like when hearing it um like reworking the darkness and and turning it into like like alchemizing it so I just thought that was just so beautiful um and yeah if you have any like advice on how to kind of like philosophize that and in our own work I guess yeah thank you for that um yeah especially because I I recognize yeah even personally, like the struggle is real, you know, the struggle to like maintain a vibrant practice, especially if if you're a working artist, like like I'm a working artist, you know, and um, kind of just the realities of, of late capitalism and everything that it requires of us, not, not even just making money to survive, which is a lot harder now. Um, I think that it's, and maybe it's ever ever been in, in America's history. Um, especially if you live in a place, you know, that's um, been affected by the forces of gentrification and you know, all of those things. So that's real, like the struggle, struggle to make art in in these times um, economically is really real. But then also I think you know, your question is pointing to that spiritual and kind of um even emotional dimension, you know, how do you stay true to the path um, when confronted with any number of uh, obstacles, you know, motivation or um, feeling up to it, or even even choosing, prioritizing the practice over other, other things. And, and I think these are living questions. These are things that always, always, um, will present themselves and never completely resolve. Um, but what I've found is, is, and you said this yourself, right? Is that recommitment, like returning to the practice and uh, allowing yourself to kind of be surprised when you do return and what's new here and keeping really the, sorry, keeping the inquiry 
and the pursuit of life within yourself, um, however it kind of comes back or wherever it takes you, I think that's that's what I found to be true is, um, yes, there are times definitely when all I can do is, is work and all I can do is kind of restore myself to continue um, laboring to survive. Um, but, but I carry that thread and I, and at this point I would say it's a part of my identity, you know? Um, so it's, for me, it's kind of like taking one hat off and putting another hat on. It's like, okay, now I'm going to, um, be this version of myself and, and do these things. Um, and it sounds like you're, you're, similar in that you have a, a need to do this work so don't be so hard on yourself because i think it's it's hard enough just to kind of get through um but yeah and, and so whenever it calls to you answer the call that's that's what i would say and that's kind of what i try to do um, it helps to have something like a daily practice um i don't myself have a everyday practice but i have an, an aspirational daily practice where you know if i can get most days of the week to make contact with some part of my practice um you know then, then for me that's good um, does that does that answer kind of that, that question totally yeah thank you so much yeah That's great. Hang on one second. Sorry, I've got two things happening in my scene here. Um, that was fantastic. I'm I'm gonna go ahead and ask a question while also still inviting folks to add their questions. Oh, and I see a hand. So uh Lucienne, I will call on you in just a minute. And I thought I might share my question now, which is uh so you mentioned Derrida's term hauntology, right? Surprise, surprise, the philosopher like <laughs> stops on that. Um and I'm just interested, right? Of course, ontology is like a sort of play on the term ontology, which is the study of what is or the study of being. Um, and ontology is like the study of not just non-being, but like the non-being of what used to be, right? Like it's, I mean, right, of uh, sort of ghosts from the past, things from the past that have left their trace in the archive. Um, I'm just interested in what, uh, this is not exactly a question. It's more like, uh, the idea that you're doing a kind of metabolizing that brings into like the our image of kind of what is things that some like our mature capitalist like mode of knowing and seeing would otherwise kind of crop out of the picture. And so I'm just I, I guess I'm I wanted to ask you some questions about like what the practice looks like materially, like you go to the archive what are you doing how are you picking things are how are they speaking to you because right i've been in the archives and they're like things are in drawers right it's like really hard to i mean it's they're really tucked away they are largely ephemera you know that everything that is there represents like a ton of things that aren't there anyway I'm just i'm curious about what your material practice looks like and then also when you uh read you also showed us images right and there was a relationship between the the language, right, and the, the poetry and the images. And is that relationship stabilized in form anywhere? Like, do you do, you know, like, I haven't seen the book, so right, is um, hurricane uh, hurricane music, right? It, does, it, does it look like that? Uh, do you always include images in your performance? Is it a live element or a stable element? So these are some questions like about your sort of material practice. And I hope my linking it to the Derrida was helpful, but I don't know if it was, so thanks. No, yeah, thank you. Um, these are good things actually for me to think about. Um, and yeah, so if if I miss something, like remind me and I'll, I'll plug it back in. Um, you know, I, the act of gathering or pursuing the archive, if we could say it's like that, um, is really just a practice of joy, right? It's, it's a practice of like being able to go places and to work with materials and, you know, to feel like um, 
I'm accessing something that's kind of forgotten and, and, and a little special in that way. Um, so, so one part, I guess, of, of the archival practice is to search out archives specific to kind of what, I, what I'm interested in. But I really like to follow my intuition. So when I was doing an artist residency in, in Portugal this last summer, um, I was going to, from Lisbon uh, to, Port, to Porto to see a couple of friends, you know, poet friends. And the day that I arrived, you know, I got off the train or whatever and um, was walking around the neighborhood where I was staying. And there was like a, a rainstorm that like just came up out, kind of out, of out of nowhere. And it was a pretty intense rainstorm. So I, I just went into this building that looked interesting and kind of attractive and it turned out to be the municipal library and they had an exhibition uh, from their collection of materials in their archive and they had this enormous it was like two and a half feet um, kind of tall um, with a span I would say of at least three feet kind of wide fully open book of of a French anatomical um, drawings, the most beautifully uh, presented an, 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 sorry, anatomy um, that I'd ever seen, you know, just done with graphite and pencil, but really lushly and ornately um, presented. And so I, I fell in love and I'm like, if they have things like this, this, this is what I want, right? This, this is what I'm looking for. And so, so I spoke to the librarians and made arrangements to kind of access the archives. And you know, it's 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 a European library and it's a Portuguese library, so there's a lot of, of red tape, you know, and navigating those uh, different bureaucracies kind of uh, becomes a part of the pursuit. Sometimes it's very frustrating, but but the joy then of of just being able to sit with um, all of these materials, uh, books centuries old um, that probably no one has looked at for, for quite a long time. And so I'll pull kind of anything, uh, topics that seem interesting, and I'll sit with stacks of books and I'll make it kind of like a days long uh, process of just thumbing through, literally like thumbing through the books um, and taking pictures of whatever images kind of, uh, speak to me, you know? And in a way, I'm in conversation with the artists who had assembled the images and the books. And that's that's a real pleasure because I get to appreciate, you know, other people's craft and, and craft that doesn't really exist the way that it used to. So then I'm thinking and meditating on, well, what was it like to live a life like this? And um, that's one mode, I would say, of, of my material practice. But the other mode is, is also kind of intuitive. And it's really just going to um, use bookstores or going to kind of antique, antique shops or things like this, and then rummaging through um, their materials and um, looking for especially older magazines or photographs or family albums sometimes. Uh, um, a friend, a friend got me uh, this this entire like slide deck uh, from different families, and so um, yeah, it's 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 there's something kind of sweet, it's something kind of like um, nice uh, engaging with other people's lives, you know, like that. Um, that's maybe a second arm of the material practice. And then to be honest, I also pick up trash, <laughs> you know, like walking down the street or whatever, like I find a, a heart sticker or something like that. And so I'll kind of catalog um, some detritus and trash and, and take it home with me. <laughs> that's great. Um, you're giving me arch archive envy. That's fantastic. Thanks. I'm gonna hand it back to Miranda now. Um, I see Luciani's hand. Luciani, do you want to pose your question? Hi, thank you. Um, yes, I 
there are so many thoughts bouncing around because so much of this is very interesting. But um, one thing I was really interested in your perspective and experience around um, putting these like material and concepts into conversation with each other. And you talk about like the visual and the verbal poetics that are happening. Um, that idea of conversation had me, I, I found myself thinking about language. I, I know the visual and verbal means that maybe this transcends verbal language, but um, I was th thinking about how I was thinking about translation of translating the wants and expressions of the materials into like how you find ways when you're augmenting to stay true to the heart of it. Um, and how in translation and language, um, a big challenge is around like cultural nuance and meaning and finding ways to like hold that all together. Um, so this is, there's this really expansive thing happening here and it's just so <laughs> interesting and I'm not sure quite how to word this, but um, I, I guess I'm interested in hearing more about your perspective on that, putting the things into conversation. And I think you've been talking about this already, but um, that was what my question was. Yeah, thank you. Um, that's, that's really, um, like rich question and I'll, I'll do my best, but I think, I think you've already started, uh, to think about this in an interesting way, you know, teaming it up with, uh, archival practice with translation practice. And, and that kind of lives inside of me in a way, because I think, uh, I don't know that I would have, pursued the archival practice as intensely if it weren't for the translation practice first. And, and I think it was in some ways, um, doesn't sound very um, interesting, but it, it was the novelty, right, of, of being able to look at other people's stuff, right? And, and there's stuff that, that they made maybe a long time ago or, or maybe recently, and just to study study different stuff. And so, so there is, in that, that work of translating the archival materials, um, it's really about, I think, trying to understand the materials and how they can live inside of, of like me. And, and when I, when I take it in, like, where does it want to go? Where does it, you know, where does the archival object, what does it want to do, I guess, um, in, inside of me? And so finding the trace of the archival object and thinking about, okay, what, what are the possible directions that this could take? You know, just given my, aesthetic framework, how I um, would regard this object and, and honor its origin, right? While also kind of elevating it um, or augmenting it as, as you say, and, and just teaming it up with, 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 with me, right? What does it look like together, these two things? And it, it's basically doing the same thing, um, the more that I add on to that. So for each archival image or object, it's thinking about what does it look like in relationship to the other archival objects and what are the implications and the trajectories and um, the, the potentials, potentialities of this larger conversation between the objects and how do they talk to each other like inside of me? And so when I was drawing these um, objects for this kind of presentation, um, I started to notice that a lot of them were leaning in a certain direction, let's say, and were suggesting a kind of uh, noir. And, and so I allowed them just to kind of show me really what, 
they wanted to do or where they could go altogether. And then a part of the work of putting them in conversation was reconstituting that direction and strengthening the connection and um, yeah, kind of also creating it. Uh, but but I try to like listen or I try to like look and see what's already there rather than just to pose something like top down. But it, that does happen basically by by listening simply to my preferences and like where do I want to go with this? Which of these objects are are interesting or inspiring to me? Um, and then from there, if I just kind of stay true to that something typically will work out. And if it doesn't, then I might have to go back and, and redraw, right? And, and look again. Um, it's almost like shuffling a deck of cards, you know, in that way. Uh, does that answer your question? I think there might, have, there might have been other parts there that I missed. Thank you, that was really interesting. I was, I, I, I was interested more in like how you thought of it. So that was very helpful, thank you. Okay, cool. Thanks. Thank you, Lusani. I see Klain's hand. Klain, do you want to verbalize your question? Hey, you can hear me? Yeah. Great. Um, hi, Sean. Thanks so much for everything. Um, this is really um, helpful to hear. And also, side note, hi, Kathleen and Miranda. It's good to see your faces. Um, Something that this is making me think about is um, how like the archive is really overwhelming or when I'm thinking about, especially thinking about the archive loosely to mean, you know, hard drives or what I can find online or whatever. It's like, I'm thinking of this kind of like backdrop of just so much content so like this big pool of potential content and it, that feels like very overwhelming um and so this practice to me seems like maybe a helpful heuristic to bracket trying to like hold all of that complexity and like find something of meaning out of it through some sort of system but rather some other like way through or into or bring something out that way um so i guess i'm just wondering um and I, I i think of things i like to think of things as like as like drives and anxieties and stuff like that and i'm wondering if part of the, this practice like comes from a, a drive that responds to an anxiety to like the bigness of like of of the pool of potential content or um like like data processing, big tech, all these things kind of being automated. Um, and if not, then just how do you see this act of kind of like divinatory um, archive searching um, within this like kind of era or epoch? Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Those are, those are great questions. And um, uh, to, the, to the first question, you know, how how does anxiety kind of inform uh, my archival practice? I, well, I wouldn't say that it, it's not the impetus, right? So my archival practice more or less comes from a um, more positive uh, place, you know, curiosity or um, interest, that kind of thing, intrigue. Um, but the anxiety presents itself, right? And it presents itself really quickly, exactly for the reasons that you say. And it's because there's just, not only is there's so much information out there of all different kinds, right? But it becomes a question, you know, of how do you, how do you access that? How do you organize that? Um, yeah, and so the anxiety presents itself um, as you say, because of the sheer number of possibilities. But what, what helps me is that I try to just cut through that. I cut through the noise um, in, in two ways. And one is just to listen to what appeals to me and make it really a practice of, um, for lack of a better way of putting it, like a, a, 
a practice of devotion or of, of love, right? Love of, of the objects and, and what they are. Um, and I try to make the pursuit of the archive less daunting um, by giving myself ways of, of uh, accessing the materials that I find pleasurable, like really, truly. Um, I can see that other artistic approaches and other artists might want to work with their anxiety um, and being inundated with the sea of information, right? And, and grappling with that. And, and that would be a perfectly legitimate and very interesting approach because, because it's true. I mean, there's too much stuff. <laughs> um, but I would say that what, what really helps, and I, I'm still learning how to do this and I, I don't have it figured out, is letting, and I think you said something about this, letting my inquiry kind of guide um, and the scale down, right? Just the vast, the vastness of potential archives. And so if I say, okay, I know that I'm going to be looking for um, materials that are like this, and I'm going to exclude everything that is not either a, a physical object first. Um, and I'm going to exclude anything that falls within the last uh, 50 years. Pretty soon, you know, by setting those constraints for the archival inquiry, it, it really does become uh, much more manageable and then more like a game uh, where you try to, you know, like a hunt, I guess you could say hunt for the materials, find them. Um, because if you have something very specific or more specific, um, even if it's just like an inquiry or something that you're interested in thinking about related to the archives, all of a sudden that's going to like set constraints that you can pursue and, and it tames the chaos. Um, so, so that's how I try to deal with that. Um, there might have been a second part of your question that I don't totally remember, um, but yeah, I hope I hope that helps. That's great, thank you. Sean, um, we just have a few more minutes, and I, if I may, I want to kind of pose one more inquiry as our kind of closing. Um, which has to do with, I, I hope that it kind of link, maybe links the last two questions from Luciani and Klein um, about the archival noir, this beautiful um, notion that you, you are working with. It's making me think about the difference between sort of the closure of the detective procedural, right? Where the mystery is solved, and I always think of noir as holding open this irresolved quality that even if kind of whoever did it is revealed, there's still this sense that it's unfinished. Um, and the unfinished past and the unfinished and unresolved quality of the archive that maybe goes to what Klein is speaking about. And then what Luciani said about this inquiry about translating, as you put it, the wants of the materials and, and those nuances. Um, and you had said earlier in your talk, um, kind of asking these questions about what it means to take things out of their context or discover them and then like listen to them and what they want right now. Um, and finally, I just think of um, Walter Benjamin's work with the Arcades Project and kind of this endless citation, work of citation, um, and his assertion that that kind of one of our one of the things we're called to is to sort of take up the unfinished that that we don't we don't necessarily well I don't know what to say about the redeemed or redemption but that he says you know this is part of the work of the living right is that we take up the unfinished work of the dead um and we don't complete it, but maybe in some way we go towards redeeming 
for example, carrying forward, you know, their work or justice or whatever it may be. Um, and so I just kind of want to reflect back to you my excitement about your notion of the archival noir in this sense and the way it seems to really hold open that paradox of reconnecting and um, redeeming but leaving open and unfinished this work. Thank you. Thank you, Miranda. Yeah, that is, is actually very helpful for me to kind of hear your perspective and to think through some of these dimensions of, of the archival noir. And um, it's all really exciting and it's all really helpful. So th thank you for that. Um, I would say maybe kind of briefly that in picking up like the lineage of the noir, it's actually really specifically uh, an act of appreciation, but it's also an act of, of revision. And it, it kind of folding in some of those other intentions, it's, it's really to try to defame um, the noir and in a way to try to exalt its beauty. And, and this is kind of the, the largest aspiration that I have for, for the work. And I don't think that I've succeeded yet um, because the, the qualities of noir, especially the visual qualities are, are very moving, very beautiful. Um, so to kind of remove some of those uh, more negative connotations that are connected to uh, the beauty of darkness, right? And, and allowing that to be elevated or, or centered in a way um, and appreciated, just simply appreciated. So I would say in a way that's part of the intention of, of the project is just to, to take up the noir and, um, and to find what there is to appreciate um, and then to revise the parts that I think um, diminish from the beauty of the form. And that's just, um, yeah, part of the conversation with the past. Oh, beautiful, Ex exalting its beauty. What a what a wonderful place to end. And um, we just can't thank you enough, Sean. For I, I feel we've learned so much from you today, and just deeply, deeply grateful and appreciative of your time. And looking forward to continuing the conversation. And big thanks to all our um, attendees and our questioners. And yeah, just thank you for being with us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all. Um, thank you for your attention and your questions and your conversation. Um, thank you, Miranda, Kathleen, and, and Evergreen College. Yeah, this is, it's an honor and I really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye.